Um, thank you to everybody joining us today. Um, and thank you to our uh, speakers, uh, Robert Pope and Asha George. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about um, where things stand with a month long disinformation campaign uh, in Ukraine about uh, biological weapons, about the US supposedly helping Ukraine build and develop new kinds of uh, weapons in, in, uh, uh, in within the borders of Ukraine. And um, we're gonna talk more about the threat that these weapons uh, may or may not pose more broadly um, you know, in the world. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, two, our two guests who I think will have some interesting perspectives on these issues. Um, first is uh, Asha George. Asha is uh, the executive director of the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. She's a member of the Bulletin's uh, Science and Security Board. Asha has served uh, in the US House of Representatives as a senior professional staffer and a subcommittee staff director at the House Committee on Homeland Security. She's uh, um, uh, been a, a military intelligence officer and a paratrooper and is a decorated Desert Storm veteran. Um, next, uh, Robert Pope. Uh, Rob is a member of the Senior Executive Service. He is the director of the Cooperative Threat Reduction Directorate for the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, uh, commonly called DITRA. Uh, in his role as director, he executes the cooperative threat reduction mission of working with international partners to eliminate weapons of mass destruction and related materials, including delivery systems, to provide safe and secure storage for materials of concern and to detect and prevent weapons of mass destruction proliferation or the spread of especially dangerous diseases. Um, so uh, one of the principal reasons uh, we're here today is because of this, uh, of this long uh, running uh, disinformation campaign emanating out of Russia, which has been about US uh, biological military biological research in Ukraine. Um, and since uh, that is uh, firmly within uh, Rob's uh, wheelhouse, I thought um, it'd be interesting, Rob, if you could just bring us up to speed on why there are US funded affiliated biological facilities within Ukraine. What's a little bit about of the history of that program for, for viewers who may not know? Yeah, thanks for that, Matt. I'll, as you said in the introduction, uh, we were, cooperative threat reduction was born out of the collapse of the former Soviet Union in uh, 1991. And we spent the early years of the program really focused on WMD and delivery system elimination. But by the time we hit the, the mid 2000s, there was a recognition that there was a lot we could do in helping partners uh, to reduce these various chemical, biological, nuclear threats. And while our, our work on the chemical and the nuclear side is tied to weapons, our work on the biological side is agnostic of where the threat comes from, whether it's a biological weapon, a leak from a laboratory, or a natural outbreak. So this enables us to work with partners like Ukraine and 30 other partners around the world to build their capacity to detect and report these outbreaks before they become a problem to their region or the rest of the world. Okay. Um, and so can you uh, uh, rewind just a little bit and take us back to uh, um, the, the uh, February when the war began at the end of the month? Um, at, we spoke at that time, actually, and, and you said that, um, uh, you know, you hadn't, your program hadn't been in, in contact with your Ukrainian partners and that uh, uh, the situation was unpredictable and, and, and sort of chaotic. And eventually the Department of Defense uh, said, uh, he put out a fact sheet in March that uh, two labs were actually under the control of Russia. And so uh, can, you, can you walk us through those earlier stages of the conflict and, and tell us, kind of give us a play-by-play -play of how things unfolded with regard to your ability to be in touch with these labs and, and have some sort of your, your people in, in control? Yeah, sure. I'll, yeah, as, as we talked back in February, you know, we've, we've worked with a total of about 46 facilities across Ukraine. Some of these are, are major uh, laboratories in the cities that do big diagnostic work. Some are, are much smaller regional things that just receive samples and do that first level work. So th there are facilities around Ukraine. And at the time we spoke, we just had no idea where the Russian invasion was going to go, what, how these facilities would be impacted and how the overall uh, public health and animal health network in Ukraine 
would be impacted. And, and as we sit here today in May, we don't have any information that any of the facilities we've partnered with have been directly affected by this 2022 invasion. So, I mean, that, that said, some of them are in Russian controlled territory right now. Some of the smaller facilities are, are not in areas that are under current Ukraine government control, but we don't know what's happened to them. We wouldn't be surprised at all, given what we've seen with other Ukrainian infrastructure, if the Russian forces have looted the facilities, taken valuable equipment out of them, uh, it's also possible that facilities have suffered damage from the, the indiscriminate attacks on infrastructure that we've seen Russia do. So it's kind of unknown what this has done. I mean, we have seen the, the, the big internally displaced populations. We've seen the, the lack of, of public services as, as utilities are, are not working anymore. So we know that the threat of disease is going up in the country. Things that you would normally associate with war like cholera on top of the ongoing COVID pandemic. So there's a lot that Ukraine's public health system has to deal with and they're gonna be doing it under strain. And you know, we've been really pleased that despite all of the stresses on this, we are still in periodic contact with some of our Ukrainian partners. Uh, and for example, we've got a group of students that are going through a field epidemiology training program that you know helps do that initial sample collection and, and disease detection work and they've asked to continue to train. So we're finding ways to work with them virtually and, and continue things like that because they want to continue to have a strong public health system despite the Russian invasion. And these must be in areas that now are the war because Russia has sort of pulled it back from Kyiv and, and some other areas and is now focusing in other parts of the country. So in areas where there's no longer such active fighting, are, am I correct in understanding that now the partners, the partnership is starting to kind of re reco recover a little bit. A, a little bit. I mean, we we still want to make sure that we're not taking up too much of their time because they obviously have bigger emergencies to deal with. But to the extent that they're reaching out to us and asking to continue to partner in some of this training, to continue to to have assistance with us to be able to get to international conferences and continue to work with partner nation scientists around the world. We're, we're trying to help them where they want to step up and continue that work. Hmm. Okay. Um, and Asha, um, let me turn to you now. Uh, about a month ago, you wrote actually in the bulletin um, about your concerns that uh, there might be, um, you know, a biological attack in Ukraine. And so I was hoping that uh, you could kind of talk to us a little bit about that and, uh, and tell us how you rate that risk um, and, and kind of a little bit about your, your, your reasoning why. Yeah, so um, the main reason that I put forward in the, in the commentary that I did for the bulletin was that um, nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, explosives have a tendency to destroy uh, all the things around them. Uh, or render them so uh, contaminated that you can't go in and uh, utilize those things. Um, it seems to me that Russia is very interested in the critical infrastructure of, of Ukraine, or at least in some of the uh, critical infrastructure of Ukraine. So if you don't want to destroy all of that, using a biological weapon actually makes sense. Um, you'd have to be able to control it, obviously, uh, and not use something that would still render critical infrastructure uh, unusable. Uh, but that was, the, that was the point I was trying to make. Um, you, if you use a biological weapon, it, it, leave, it doesn't infect the critical infrastructure, it's infecting the people and the animals, possibly the plants. Uh, so that was, I was looking at it from a military standpoint. Uh, one of the reasons um, militaries have considered and then uh, decided not to use biological weapons in the past is this issue of control, though. Uh, it's not like you can say, I want to, I'm going to deploy this biological weapon here. And if it's a, if it's a weapon that creates a contagious disease, you can't say it's just going to, you know, stay in this prescribed area and not go anywhere else. Um, we've just finished experiencing that with COVID, right? So it, it depends on what you're using, I or would be using, I suppose. Um, but 
I'm, I am concerned about that. I'm also concerned that um, things are not going the way Russia thought it was going to go uh, in, in Ukraine uh, with the sort of tactics they were using to begin with. Um, and as they are searching about for other tactics to use and other ways to gain control of the country, I think it just becomes more and more possible that they might use a biological weapon. Um, it's one of the uh, ways in which they can gain an, uh, an advantage. Um, and it would definitely be asymmetric because we don't have biological weapons um, that, that the Ukraine would be using. And even if they did, it's not that kind of thing, right? Well, we'll deploy a biological weapon that will somehow stop your biological weapon. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way either. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but does Russia have um, such weapons to use? I mean, were there statements that they made that may, uh, would lend one to think that they, they would, they are considering uh, this sort of thing? I know that the, the White House at one point said that, um, uh, you know, we should all be on alert for uh, Russian chemical or biological weapons attacks. Um, and there was concern that there would be some kind of false flag uh, operation whereby Russia used one of these uh, weapons of mass destruction and then tried to pin it on the Ukrainians. So uh, what, what about the, you know, the specific discourse that you've been hearing uh, makes you think uh, that this is a real possibility? Well, historically, uh, the Russians haven't been as open as we would have liked uh, when it comes to their biological uh, weapons laboratories within, within Russia. Um, and, you know, maybe Rob can speak to that uh, a, a, as well. Um, so for, for many years, even after we discontinued our offensive biological weapons program, Russia continued. The former Soviet Union continued. Now they say that they continued because they didn't believe that we stopped ours, but we really did stop ours. So they continued on. Then at some point, they, they it seems like they believed that we didn't have ours anymore. But there were other things that were happening. Um, they did bury a bunch of bio weaponized biological agents uh, in, uh, in that island in the Aral Sea. Um, uh, there's nothing, we don't really have a whole lot of evidence because we haven't been, we can't crawl all over the former Soviet Union uh, and, and make all these determinations. Um, but just because they buried some stuff in the Aral Sea uh, doesn't mean they didn't bury it somewhere else. It also doesn't mean that even if they destroyed it all, that they're not capable of recreating more biological agents. Um, I, th I think that, um, the, the White House expressing its concern, uh, in part at least, is looking at a report that the State Department put out last year in which they um, very definitively said that Russia and North Korea have active biological weapons, offensive biological weapons programs. Um, so they may not, we don't even have to look at the historical piece of what the former Soviet Union was doing. We can just look at whatever the State Department has uh, looked at and the intelligence community here and our allies have discovered and just look at recent uh, reports that they have a program. Um, and I, I, I think it just makes some logical sense to at least prepare for the possible use of biological weapons um, because they're at war and it's a weapon that they have within their arsenal. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. Um... So, and of course, uh, Russia is a signatory to the Biological Weapons Convention, which bans the production uh, of biological weapons, and uh, as is the U.S. and, and Ukraine. Um, are, are the, I guess, is, do, you, do you think that among all the other difficulties that you talked about regarding biological weapons, controlling them, et cetera, um, are these international systems that are in place, aren't they I guess deterrent enough for anyone like Russia, perhaps, to 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 dissuade them from using these sort of weapons. I don't think so, Matt. I think uh, biological weapons are 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 difficult to to deal with when it comes to these international treaties and conventions. Uh, one of the biggest problems with biological weapons convention is that it's extremely hard to verify who is doing what exactly. 
and um, a, there's a there's a lot of of research that we refer to as dual use uh, that that could go one way or could go another way, and um, that just makes it even more difficult when it comes to verification. And then you add a third layer when it comes to the development of medical countermeasures or just other countermeasures in general. Um, it, what you have to do to get to the point where you can uh, create a countermeasure may in and of itself look like you're on the path to developing a biological weapon. Uh, you, you, you're probably not. Uh, you know, we, we'd like to say that we're not in the United States, but you can't just do nothing and then say, you know, I think I'm going to develop an antibiotic um, for a group of non-specified um, uh, symptoms or uh, uh, a non-specified vague notion of what a biological weapon might look like. Um, it's extremely difficult. It's extremely challenging. I think it's good to have the convention and, and, and these treaties. Um, it's helpful. It's helpful diplomatically. And at least it's an indication of somebody's intention uh, that they that they really think that this is a good idea and you know we shouldn't use these kinds of biological weapons. But if you can't verify, if uh, if it's very easy for people to sign on to something and then not actually adhere, uh, then no, I would say it does, that it does, they just can't serve as the deterrence that we would like them to serve as. Interesting. Um, and uh, Rob. Um, so the disinformation campaign uh, against the, the the labs in Ukraine, um, you know, it didn't start with these labs in Ukraine. Uh, it, some may some say that this is sort of like uh, a continuation of misinformation, disinformation that the Soviet Union practiced decades ago. You know, there was this idea that the U.S. created HIV as a uh, um, a bioweapon at, at, at some point down the line. And, and that story had legs and I guess is now still making the rounds in some circles. Um, but um, regarding the labs in Ukraine, um, you know, uh, in, you know, just a few years back, a lot of these narratives were directed against similar labs in other countries like in, in Georgia. Um, so when can you tell me when did you start realizing that there was a a this that this narrative about the U.S. military links to Ukrainian labs? When did when did you start realizing that that was becoming an issue and a problem for you? Yeah, it's a good question. As as you say, we've we've seen Russian disinformation go all the way back to the Soviet Union, and uh, as you pointed out. In the earlier part, you know, last decade, most of that was directed toward U.S. partnerships with Georgia and with Kazakhstan, where we partnered to provide some fairly significant infrastructure for their public health and animal health. All, where we first really saw it tick up with Ukraine was the 2014 invasion of Crimea and the Donbass. At that point, it really seemed to, to ramp up focused on Ukraine, and I really think the, the underlying motivation there was trying to drive a wedge between Ukraine and Western cooperation and put this line in the sand that countries from the former Soviet Union, like Ukraine, belong in a Russian sphere of influence and shouldn't be partnering with the West. So the, this uptick in, in focused disinformation on Ukraine, and, and as we see continued in the other former Soviet republics, I think are all part of that underlying idea of these countries belong to Russia and anything we can do that shows that the United States is a nefarious actor is a way to, to try to push the US and the Western powers out and, and pull Ukraine in rather than letting all these countries make their own sovereign choices as to who their partners are. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, <clears throat> I guess as I've heard that in, in contrast to uh, previous iterations of this campaign, this one uh, really went to the top. I mean, you had Vladimir Putin himself kind of espousing it. You had the, the, the uh, representative, Russian representative to the uh, United Nations talking about it at, in detail at a UN Security Council meeting and uh, officials discussing it in other venues as well. And um, I think one of the other things that's quite surprising is that it kind of jumped across the Atlantic and started making serious waves here in the United States. Um, first with sort of fringy QAnon type influencers, and but eventually uh, these uh, 
these lines were being repeated by you know Tucker Carlson on one of the most popular television shows in in the United States. Um, so I mean, it just strikes me as an incredibly effective disinformation campaign if all of a sudden you're at the mainstream networks in your in an adversarial country are kind of credulously reporting on it. So. Tell me, uh, what did you make of that? Why did it get legs here? And uh, how does that impact the work you're, you're doing? I think we see that, that, you know, Russia understands information warfare and this idea of focusing so many efforts from so many speakers for, from Vladimir Putin on down on trying to create this idea of a, a really juicy conspiratorial story that the people who you know have certain opinions about uh, the the world want to believe, so they they take things that are true, uh, you know the elements of health surveillance work that we partner with Ukraine on that is meant to help them understand the pathogens that circulate in their country, and that are openly and transparently published, openly and transparently discussed in international scientific conferences, the the grants and the contracts that we use that we then put out on, on transparent websites so the US public can see how their tax dollars are being spent to improve global health security. The, the, the Russians will then say they've discovered these things and cherry pick sentences from them to try to prove nefarious intent. And I think as they target an audience like the QAnon believers, you know, being able to take some of the scary sounding words about biological science and couple them with a web of of government actors and contractors and completely unrelated things like drones or hunter biden is is kind of red meat for that so they really understand how to target audiences to try to get a desired effect and fortunately it hasn't had really any impact on what we do with our partners because we work with professionals in ministries of health ministries of agriculture scientists who understand the research, understand the nuances of what we do, and they haven't been dissuaded by the, the Russian mischaracterizations. Mm -hmm. um, I see. Um, and these, the, like you were alluding to, a lot of this information came from public support uh, venues, it came from published papers, from scientific conferences, that kind of stuff, and, and then it was uh, touted as discovered materials. Um, you know, and I've seen the all kinds of things. A Russian general was giving a presentation in, in March about uh, avian uh, research involving avian influenza and having you know birds or something fly that across the border to Russia, or uh, you know the development of targeted genetic weapons against Russian DNA. So, can, I mean, did did these narratives surprise you? I mean, what, what did you, what did you make of them, and uh, how, how do we know that? Um, how can the viewers be certain that these are just kind of false disinformation narratives? Yeah, it's it's a good question. Uh, you know, obviously, those who can read the science, you know, understand the journal articles that we have published, you know, read them in their entirety, will see exactly what they are, which is helping partner nations to understand how diseases spread in their countries, how diseases cross borders, how they can predict when various pathogens are going to become more or less important with seasons, you know, that sort of thing. So the epidemiologists and the clinicians are looking in the right place at the right time to nip an outbreak in the bud. So it's it's all out there for folks who can read it in the context that's out there. Uh, I think what we learned as you know part of the U.S. government is we need to do a much better job of telling our story. That until this really got bad in February we were letting the Russians control the information narrative on this. So, you know, the learning for us is to engage more in venues like this, where we do get a chance to explain why we do what we do and help people find these resources and understand what's out there. Mm -hmm. uh, great. Um, and Asha, um, going back to you, uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the, the um, risks of biological weapons overall, not specifically in Ukraine. Uh, you mentioned three, you know, some Russian labs that the U.S. State Department um, uh, highlighted in, in a recent report on, uh, and, and it alleged that these labs were part of Russia's violation of the Biological Weapons Convention. Um, that report also said that there were other countries under engaging in questionable activities uh, as well. Um, and uh, you've said that this is uh, 
part of a in, in biological uh, arms race. Um, and uh, I know that there are folks that, don't, that, that, that disagree, that think, well, if Russia is doing it, it doesn't mean it's really an arms race. And, and we don't, you know, the specifics on what these labs are really doing is, is that the Russian labs uh, is, is pretty um, sparse uh, in terms of publicly available information. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, how do you see the state of play in terms of a, a biological arms race? And, um, you know, to what extent do you think countries are skirting uh, lines or outright crossing them uh, with respect to weapons programs? And, and if, if they are, then what do you think should be done? So I do think that we, um, we have arms races, races, plural. Um, I don't think that every country in the entire world is involved in developing biological weapons, uh, not any more than I think every country in the world is, uh, has participated in the nuclear arms race. Uh, there are limitations to what you can do. Not, every, not everybody has the scientific expertise. Not everybody has the, the critical infrastructure or other resources needed to, to produce biological weapons on a large scale. Um, but they're certainly capable of producing them on a small scale. And, um, you know, for pre-weaponized material and all of that, uh, there are concerns that uh, people could get a hold of that and then they only have to do a little bit else to, to produce a biological weapons, a weapon. I would have to say there's, I mean, there's all kinds of theory, you know, sort of floating around about what could be happening. Um, but I, I, I will tell you that when China decided to invest billions of dollars in their bioeconomy, they came, they actually said that they were going to invest billions of dollars in their bioeconomy. And uh, they, were, they were open about a certain dollar amount. And most of us thought, well, that's what they're willing to say, you know, sort of out loud. Uh, what else is going on? How much more money are they putting in? Um, it's not unusual for Russia to look at its neighbor, China, and look at what they're doing and then start to freak out about what they might be doing and probably vice versa, let's be fair. Um, but my understanding is that when China started to do this and make all these investments, Russia uh, saw the implications and that Russia said, okay, well then, you know, we need to, we need to ramp up too. And um, for Russia, it's, you know, I have to say it was, it was, it was different, they did have, former laboratories uh, or laboratories that uh, in the best case were formerly used to develop biological weapons. Some of those laboratories were shuttered, others, others were not. Um, but I always just imagined that uh, when this decision was made, that somebody went through some of those old laboratories and just started turning the lights back on. Uh, they have the infrastructure, they have the capability, they are an advanced country, no matter what everybody's attitude is about uh, and feelings are about invading another country like Ukraine, um, they, they can do it. Um, and it is my understanding that they are engaged in, in doing it. They're, but they're looking at um, it wasn't sort of like de novo with, with nothing um, out there they were reacting to. They were reacting to the perception of what China was doing. Um, now, I would tell you that beyond that, um, it's not going to be just Russia and China. Uh, and that's the big concern. Um, there are other countries in that region too. And everybody's beginning to get worried and concerned about this. So you're going to see more and more ramping up. North Korea has an active offensive biological weapons program. Uh, Russia does too. The State Department referred to China and Iran without going all the way over and saying they too definitely have offensive biological programs. But my reading of that report says they're, they're very close. So that's four countries. Um, we, have to, we have to assume that other countries are beginning to engage too. To what extent, Matt, I don't, I don't know, obviously, and I don't think we know either. Um, but, but we have to prepare as if more countries are jumping into this. We cannot afford to say, well, nobody's doing anything because we're not doing anything. So therefore, we don't have to prepare for this and we don't have to engage. Um, I think the United States is most definitely leading uh, forward. Some programs are already in place, like the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. Um, the Department of Defense is undergoing a biodefense posture review. Uh, you know, they don't undergo posture reviews because they don't think anything is happening. They're not pulling threats out of the sky and saying, well, let's do this. Um, they're concerned. 
uh, other parts of the, the United States government uh, are, are looking at what, uh, what they have in place, what do they need to do to prepare, what would it be like? There's red teaming activity and all that going on. Um, I, but I want to be clear: not all of it is new. It's that the, the government just jumped up and said, "Okay, well, today this is a problem." Uh, many agencies have been looking at this for a long time. But I would say that in terms of priorities, it's not always been uh, a very high priority. I think it is a higher priority now because of these arms races. Hmm. Thank you. Um, and despite the the long list of questions, I still wanted to talk, ask you both. Um, uh, Hallie uh, at the bulletin is telling me it's time to move uh, to audience questions. Um, so with that, I'll let her take the wheel. Thanks, Matt. Hello again. As a reminder, my name is Hallie Posner and I'm the program manager here at the bulletin. If you have a question for our speakers or moderator, please put it in the Q&A function so our speakers can see them. This can be found at the bottom of your screen. Please do not put your questions in the chat. When you are called on to ask a question, you will re receive a prompt on your screen to unmute yourself. Please accept that prompt and ask one question. And as a quick reminder, a recording of this program will be available on our website in the coming days. Now, let's move on to our first question. Reed Kirby, you are our first. Would you unmute yourself, please? Yeah. Hey, guys. Hello, we hear you. Okay, so I had uh, two questions. One was, why biological versus chemical? I mean, chemical is a lot more tactical and controllable versus biological. Why the thought of biological being more likely? Um, I guess for me, I, I, I'll say I'm, I'm, I don't I don't know that any of us can really calculate the odds here comparing chemical to to biological and say definitively that one has a higher risk than the other. Um, I do think that um, Russia has been accused quite a bit of using chemical weapons and might not be inclined to do so again because everybody's sort of on them about that. Um, and, uh, and, and certainly um, there are allegations that they provided chemical weapons to other countries to use against their populaces. Uh, so that might, might make it a, a lower risk. But I would also say um, one, of the, one of the things about using a chemical weapon is that uh, generally there are um, chemicals. There's, there's, there's something physical that you can look at. There's a gas going out or there's, there's a particulate matter that's, that's landed somewhere. There are powders or things that are around. And so it becomes really obvious that you've done something. Um, with a biological weapon, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, uh, you could, you could set off a biological weapon and, you know, in a place perhaps that not everybody's looking, not everybody's seeing, and then, and then disease can spread without any, um, visible evidence that it's, that it's spreading until people become ill. Um, I, I would also add that, um, you know, when we talk about these things and we put the W on the end of biological or chemical or whatever it is, uh, we have a tendency to go directly to worst case scenario, the Russians are going to use smallpox. Um, nothing says that they have to do that. They could ratchet all the way down to, to uh, a much less um, uh, deadly uh, and overt disease in a biological weapon that would fly through a population and weaken it so much that it, it just can't survive anymore or that it can't fight anymore um, as opposed to uh, and you know and then that's useful from a military standpoint if you're going to take over another country um, you know as opposed to the big obvious uh, thing so I guess I, I guess my answer is is just that um, I, I think that the use of a biological weapon would be less obvious at least at first and let's face it we've had some great difficulties with biological attribution in recent years. Uh, we're still not sure what happened with COVID. We're not great at doing attribution. I will, I will give a hat, uh, take my hat off though to Ditra who is trying to do a lot of this in, the, in this field to, to improve biological attribution. But uh, we're much better at chemical attribution to, to, to be honest. So that's, that's my thinking about this. Yeah, and I would just add that uh, uh, 
chemical weapons, you know, by and large have a, a fairly localized sort of impact where the, the biological weapon, if it's a highly infectious disease, can spread through population, cross international borders, go global like we've seen with COVID. So just in terms of the practical way that, that the cooperative threat reduction approaches these relative threats, we've done a lot more investment with our partners in helping build their ability to do that early, safe, and effective detection of that pathogen to catch it as close to the source and as close to the beginning of an outbreak as possible, whether it's a biological weapon or from a natural source. So that, that's, that's why we've worked so hard to, to try to prepare countries like Ukraine to give us that early detection of the biological threat. Uh, so yeah, I, I can't speak to which one's more likely as a weapon, but I would certainly say biological is more dangerous than chemical if it's used. Thank you. Um, and so, sorry, Reed, I think we'll have to take a question from another audience member now. Um, so Hallie, why don't you uh, let us know who's next? Sure, next we'll have Sean Odea. Sean, will you unmute yourself, please? Hi, just watching from Canberra, Australia. Just after, a, a, just a question for both of you in terms of, uh, in broader terms, what work is being done by the US and other countries to ensure that to monitor the safety of these facilities in Ukraine? I mean, what can we see? What can we do? Uh, what do we know which is happening? All that sort of stuff in terms of the safety of the facilities, just in broad terms. Rob? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we build safety into all of these partner nation laboratories as we're working with them. That's, that's part of the design. It's part of our training with the scientists that work in the labs, with the clinicians to make sure that there are safe places to store the pathogens that they have to keep from the samples they're collecting and diagnosing or their reference samples needed, uh, safe laboratory spaces, uh, certified biosafety cabinets, that all of this is properly functioning. So when, when these countries are not under threat of invasion, everything is built to be safe. With the, the impact of the Russian invasion, we do continue to be concerned that the, the impact of war could lead to some sort of a, a spillage or a safety impact. And that's why the, uh, the World Health Organization several weeks ago recommended to Ukraine that they eliminate as many of the uh, live pathogens in these labs as they were willing to get rid of. And we don't have specific information as to which of these labs did or didn't do that, but the Ukrainians understand the safety impact and for all the labs they still control you know, the little bit that we're hearing from the Ministry of Health is, is they're taking the necessary precautions to keep these facilities safe. Thank you. All right, our next question will be from um, um, Diane Flanagan. Diane, will you unmute yourself, please? Yes, hi there. Um, my question is, how can we educate the public better? I'm with the medical reserve. So with all the disinformation, what can we do to educate the public better? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Rob, do you want to tackle this one? Yeah, I'll, I'll certainly take a crack at it. That, you know, I think, as I alluded earlier, that, that we have kind of approached this for many years as quiet professionals, where we didn't talk about our work so much as just try to get the work done. And learning particularly here in February that we've seeded the information battlefield to Russia and their disinformation tells us that we need to do a much better job of just routinely talking about what we do, whether it's out in the media, whether it's on our website, if we have opportunities to, to work with groups at uh, university level, you know, a, a, any place where we can talk a little bit more about why biosafety is important, why biosecurity is important, why it's important for there to be a global capability to detect and report pathogens in accordance with international health regulations. I mean, these aren't things most Americans think about, and we need to figure out how to be better at talking about that in a way that matters to the average person. Thank you. And our next question will be from Julian Weissglass. Julian, will you? Uh, thank you. Um, so how do you, you seem very sure that we're not the United States, we, are not developing uh, biological weapons. And uh, we certainly would not admit it. We wouldn't be public about it, it would be secret. Uh, and we have not skimped on any funding for nuclear weapons, which are arguably just as much of existential threat to humanity as 
as uh, biological weapons. Asha? Um, well, uh, I, I guess uh, I depend on um, uh, the determination and the ending of the biological weapons program here in the United States uh, of 1976 as evidence that we stopped producing biological weapons. Um, we don't have a similar decision by a president to have stopped the nuclear weapons program. Um, we, we did stop, I think, developing chemical weapons. We destroyed a lot of our, our own chemical weapons. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's what I would say. But to be honest with you, um, as with Russia, as with other places, I myself have not gone everywhere and have not looked in every little classified niche to see whether, whether we still we still have it, but I believe from what I have seen that we are not developing biological weapons. Um, and maybe that, uh, you know, the US maintained a defensive uh, program um, and which continues yeah. to this day, uh, Asha, and is that, are there misconceptions about the nature of this program? I think that I think that there are, and I think that there that it that it is easy to misconceive what's uh, misunderstand what's what is going on. I have to agree with Rob that uh, quite a few of the people involved in in the defense against biological agents and biological diseases and biological accidents have been quiet professionals who have just sort of put their head down and been trying to trying to do the best they can for, for the American people, but they haven't, not, and it's not because they're trying to hold the information, they just haven't been open about what, what they're doing and why they're doing it to the fullest extent that they, I think that they could be. And when you do that, then, it, then especially with the conspiracy theories and all that stuff, um, people, it, it's easy to misunderstand, but I would also say this, in today's age, and in this country, we have a huge number of people who are who are educated, but are also fully capable of using the internet, whether they're educated or not. And um, when people have a question, they all default automatically to going to the internet and seeing what they can find. Um, I think what we have to do to to alter that is get more information out there on the internet uh, and and elsewhere to talk about it. Um, you know, look, there are plenty of areas in the United States uh, in our culture where we're just full of pride and are willing to talk about absolutely everything. Um, I think we need to extend that to this arena so that there's more information going out and more information that people can find for them to read and look at and, and understand. Mm -hmm. Rob, did you have any uh, thing to say on, on this, this topic? It, it, this is a hard one to prove to skeptics. I mean, we have a lot of uh, nuclear weapons treaties which have verification protocols and here other elements of the Defense Threat Reduction Agency are the ones who go on site and, and do those inspections. The Chemical Weapons Convention has verification protocols. So as Asha mentioned, the United States is still in the final stages of declaring or er, er, uh, destroying its chemical weapons arsenal. And there are inspectors that frequently visit the two plants where that's occurring. So you can see that the arsenal is being destroyed. The the There just isn't that same ability the way the Biological Weapons Convention has been put together. So we can we can say that we're not doing it. I have strong confidence that the United States doesn't have a biological weapons program, but there's no real way to demonstrate it. Thank you. Um, next question, Hallie. Sure. Our next question is from Sophia Garcia. Hi. Um, so I guess my question is kind of going, I think we had a question similar to this, but are there any concerns regarding Russia or any other non-state actors potentially obtaining any of the critical information that we have in our partner labs in Ukraine? Like any information that we use in terms of, you know, um, our safety, biosafety measures, but that could are, and that are dual use that could be used for illicit purposes and to enhance their weapons programs. Yeah, that's a, a great question. And, and I'll say we have no concerns at all about that because the, these aren't biodefense laboratories. They're, they're not doing that kind of countering biological weapon research. They are 
strictly the, the same kind of public health research that you'd find in your local county or state level public health lab here in the United States. So it's standard uh, safety and security protocol falls in line with best practices from the World Health Organization and any pathogen samples that may be in these labs are coming from the natural environment in Ukraine. It would be the same kinds of pathogens that Russia already has access to. So no, there's nothing Russia is going to learn or gain from entering any of these facilities. I, I also just would add that Russia has plenty of BSL-4 laboratories and, and lower level laboratories and are, uh, is, is fully aware of what it takes to to, to secure such a laboratory and or lab, these laboratories and understand the uh, laboratory protocols. So I don't think finding a biosafety or biosecurity laboratory protocol uh, in one of these Ukrainian laboratories is suddenly gonna blow open the doors for Russia in terms of what, what they might learn. Um, I, I don't think that that would, I don't think it would be a bad thing. Maybe they would learn something more about how to do it better. Um, I mean, I don't want to joke about it, but I think that that is, that would be the case. Thanks. And our next question will be from Richard Guthrie. <clears throat> yes, hello, uh, good evening. Um, or sorry, it's good evening over here. Um, what might be the impact of the statement by Bonnie Jenkins to the Biological Weapons Convention meeting of states parties last year, in which she suggested the US be more open to discussing compliance issues within the convention? And just as a supplementary to that, I mean, there is consistently a difference in view transatlantically on what verification of the BWC means. I think one of the historical problems is that uh, US commentators tend to equate verification with material balance as done in nuclear and chemical. Mm -hmm. And in biological, obviously that doesn't work. Uh, but there are other methods for verifying and other measures, measures to both present compliance and assess compliance of others. And it would be good internationally to move forward on these. Uh, what do you think of the Jenkins statement? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Asha? Would you yeah, like I, I, what I would say is, is um, or what I will say, is uh, I think that the decision that the United States made um, back during the George W. Bush administration to step further away from the BWC, even though it remained a signatory, um, on the basis of this disagreement about verification, I think that that was, that was a mistake and it was something that uh, bothered many countries and many signatories to the Biological Weapons Convention. I think you're absolutely right. There are disagreements about how to verify and whether we can verify and what constitutes verification. Um, I don't think it's a question of openness. I don't think the, the U.S. Is, high, is, is closed about something, but I do think that, there are, um, that the United States has not engaged to the fullest extent in solving this problem of, of verification and finding, um, finding ways that the United States and others uh, would find acceptable to verify whether somebody is producing or maintaining biological weapons or, or not. Um, so I think Bonnie is, Bonnie is right, but I also think uh, that, um, uh, that, there's, that there's a broader landscape here and it's really about uh, engaging in that discussion. Um, I think we have to do it more frequently than whenever the BWC has its um, has its conferences, and I think um, I think we have to main, maintain this activity. It's been too many decades now of just well, you know, us disagreeing, us meaning the globe disagreeing about what constitutes verification, um, and then we just sort of throw our hands up and say, okay, well, so we'll, next time the BWC meets, we'll talk about it again. That's not the way. That's not the way to go with this. Thank you, Asha. And uh, uh, Rob, uh, if, in, unless you had something to add on that, that topic, um, I wanted to uh, uh, give you both time to kind of uh, share some final thoughts with us before the webinar wraps up. Um, so why don't we start with, uh, with you, Rob? Yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciate uh, the, the bulletin for hosting this event and, and everybody who's tuned in to, to listen to what's a, a really you know, for us, passionate thing of, of trying to make the world safer from uh, infectious disease and pandemics and the, the way the Russians are trying to mischaracterize that and put it under threat. So, you know, it's 
an opportunity for us to, to try to better explain the story about why we spend American tax dollars to do what we're trying to do to create these broader biosurveillance networks for the benefit of our partners and for the benefit of the globe and, and really do appreciate the chance to talk about it for a bit. Great. Asha? Uh, well, I, I'll just end by saying, you know, these conversations are difficult and, and they always wind up, you know, traveling into the arena where we're thinking about worst case scenarios and zombie outbreaks and uh, the end of humanity and gee, everything is so difficult and, and it just all seems uh, incredibly challenging and um, almost hopeless. But I don't think that that's the case. I think uh, as with, with other problems and other issues, we can meet this challenge, um, but we're gonna have to do it with some dedicated effort and um, dedicated attention. The United States has to, and, many, and, and the rest of the world too, it's not just about us. We have to get out of the, the habit of reacting to things and being proactive uh, about them. Um, but I think we absolutely can do that. I just think we really need to pay attention and focus on it right now. If we do that through um, forums like this and uh, through programs like uh, DITRA runs and, and other avenues, I, I think we can uh, move forward and make the world a safer place. We just have to pay more attention consistently. Well, thank you for that. Um... Asha. Um, so yeah, it's just been a, a fascinating uh, story uh, to, to it, troubling, but yet fascinating to see this, this disinformation campaign kind of in action and kind of ratchet up and just echo across the world. And, and it, on the one hand, uh, it's, um, I mean, it just like, it seemed so easy. You had these people saying, oh, look at this document I pulled up. It shows this terrible stuff going on in, in Ukraine. And then you know, it's the, it, with five minutes of attention, you can see that the, what they're portraying is not legitimate in any way, shape, or form. Yet, all of a sudden, we're talking about it on uh, evening cable news programs in, in the United States. And, um, and so, I wanted to thank uh, uh, both of you for coming today and, and sharing your, your your thoughts on this issue. And um, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure our audience did appreciated hearing your, your perspectives. And, and thank you also to um, um, Hallie and uh, Rachel and Brandon at the Bulletin for helping to coordinate this and for um, our audience members for engaging with us and asking some really important questions. Um, and with that, I, I will pass it back to Hallie to close the program. Thanks, Matt. You took the words right out of my mouth. Thank you to everyone for this incredibly dynamic uh, conversation. And to our audience, uh, if you happen to be in New York next week, make your way to Times Square to see Amnesia Atomica NYC, an exposition and call to reduce the dangers of nuclear weapons. More information can be found at thebulletin.org slash events. And last but not least, thank you to all of you for supporting the Bulletin and participating with us for the last hour. Ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned. <laughs>